right, before Brother Mike comes up uh, with his message this evening, we'll do page 236, 236. <clears throat> Amazing Grace. We'll do all four verses. Uh, okay, let's... Okay, I want to get together here. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves I was thinking to myself, uh, when plans end up changing there, of course, that's uh, Pastor Ward just trying to keep me flexible, I guess. But uh, I was thinking to myself, would it be wrong if I asked for one of the songs that I actually chose? <laughs> I know that would be a cruel trick, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you'd say no, right? <laughs> well, I'll have you turn in your Bibles tonight as we continue my study that I've been doing through the Kings here. 2 Chronicles chapter 18 tonight, picking up where I left off last month. And by the way, just to throw in a plug for Sunday school, I know most of you in this room are already here for that, but Pastor Ward is actually going to be starting through a series on the Kings in Sunday school. So if you want a little more information than what I can give you, then by all means, come back for that. But uh, tonight we'll be in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, so hold a finger there once you've found it, and then also turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, kind of like I did last month. I have kind of a thought to act as a backdrop for our study. And once we read the verses, you probably have a good idea of kind of what the theme of the message will be tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'll go ahead and start reading in verse number 14. Again, probably some familiar verses for most of us here. And it says there, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So thinking about our, our fellowship, our unions, our alliances, our friendships, relationships with people. 
looking at those kinds of things. And in the life of Jehoshaphat tonight, we'll be looking at a relationship that he developed with a neighboring, uh, of course, I mean, they are Israel as well. You have the southern and the northern kingdoms at this point, and Jehoshaphat and, of course, Ahab, who we've studied before as part of my series of messages here. We'll get into that a little bit more, but just thinking to ourselves here, I know I'd, we call this a Bible study, and I'd, I sometimes get in the habit of just kind of talking at people and have the desire to want to be a little more interactive. So I, I kind of have a thought that I want to throw out there and kind of get your feedback on it. What are some kinds of relationships, some kinds of scenarios, situations where you might want to think about this kind of advice from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the being unequally yoked? Well, what are some scenarios where you might consider putting that into practice? You can feel free to talk at me. Marriages. I know people bring up the context of marriage a lot with this. Brother Scott? businesses, yeah. I don't know, maybe I planted a, a seed with some of the words that I said, but definitely that. You don't want to get wrong in the wrong business deals. Yeah, so friendships, just borrowed my words there, but uh, it's, uh, it's very true. Be careful who your friends are. You know, and you know, interesting that uh, Madeline brings that up. It's usually people of that age where we're encouraging things like that. You know, be careful who your friends are. So any other thoughts about types of situations where you might want to employ 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Brother Gill? Dating. Dating. For sure. Jobs. Yeah, jobs. You know, and that's interesting that you bring that up too, because I can think of a kind of a bad decision. It was kind of a pragmatic decision that I made at one point in my life because I needed money. So I, I ended up working a job where I had to serve alcohol. I didn't know when I took the job initially uh, that that's what I would be doing. Uh, but once I walked in the doors of that business, I realized this probably wasn't the best choice to take on this kind of a job. So thinking about things like my testimony from that point. So definitely things like that. So any other thoughts from you guys? So Brother Phil. Activities, yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, there you go. What church do you attend? Hey, I'm glad you're here tonight. <laughs> but uh, you know, I might talk about some of this a little later. You're talking about how churches might like to work together sometimes, and that can be a dangerous thing nowadays. And in fact, some of those verses from Second Corinthians chapter six are quoted by people of our stripe. You know, fundamental, independent Baptist people, be ye separate. You know, come out from among them. You know, kind of the battle cry of, of those who would separate from those who are, uh, we see as not following the convictions that we get from the Bible. So some other thoughts, and Pastor Ward kind of brought up Ephesians 5. Uh, Brother Gill? Yeah. <laughs> what school do you send your kids to? Well, you know, homeschool, that's a really good option for a lot of Christians nowadays based on what we see as our educational options out, out in public. You know, and actually, I was raised up in a public school, and God had mercy on me, and I ended up the way that I did. But, you know, be careful. You know, parents who have to make those kinds of decisions, and maybe I'm preaching to myself because one day I might be making those decisions. So another thought, and uh, bringing up Ephesians chapter 5 again, I have some other verses that I'd like to read kind of along the same lines here. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 5. Paul writing there, he says, For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God, so kind of setting the backdrop for what he's about to say, he says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So would you want to be in fellowship with these kinds of people? Verse number 7, it says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. 
proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Hey, before you knew the Lord, there are probably things about your past that you were ashamed of. And it's those kinds of things that nowadays, those who know you as a believer, you wouldn't be caught dead doing some of those same things. And hopefully that's your conviction that you've left those things behind now because you have a new life in Christ. So thinking about these kinds of thoughts, we're going to look at King Jehoshaphat tonight. And we're going to evaluate his life. And I like how honest the Bible is when it comes to the different people that we find. Even someone like King David, we think of him as being this great king, and yet he had his faults. And we look at a number of different people in the Bible. In fact, most people that you read about in the Bible, they had some kind of fault. Now, of course, the Bible also says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That applies to anyone. And so even those whom the Bible does not necessarily say anything bad about, they still fall under the curse. And they have the the sin nature of mankind that comes upon them as it's passed from Adam throughout the human race. But again, Jehoshaphat, and as I've mentioned about some of the kings, you have this kind of spectrum of good and evil with them. And while the Bible does generally classify Jehoshaphat as one who did that which is right in the eyes of the Lord, Yet there are some decisions that he made which are examples that you wouldn't necessarily want to follow, but the Bible gives us those things for our learning and for our admonition. So I'll go ahead and read the first several verses out of chapter 18, back in 2 Chronicles now, as we get started looking at this chapter tonight. It says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and I wish the verse stopped there, but then it says, And joined affinity... With Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Let's go ahead and open our, our time tonight in the Word with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that I have to be able to teach your Word. Help me, Lord, to be able to rightly divide it. And as your Holy Spirit leads during this time, uh, even reminding me of things that I've learned and, and you would want me to say, uh, that you would be using your Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of these who are here tonight, that if there's something, Lord, that needs to change in our own lives and any of the areas which are touched upon tonight, then just do that surgery, Lord, and help us to be moldable and willing to be yielded to your will and to do things that will please you. We ask for your help tonight, for your strength, in Jesus' name, amen. So looking at Jehoshaphat, so this is the second message that I have concerning the life of Jehoshaphat, and I've entitled this part of this study, The Consequences of Compromise. Have you ever made any decisions that you look back at later in life and you regret? And if you'd never made that first decision to get involved with something or with somebody, you'd go back and change that in a heartbeat. You know, I can think of instances like that in my life where if I just made a different decision at one point in time, I, I could have stopped a whole snowball from rolling forward and have to make some uncomfortable decisions later on and make some uncomfortable confrontations with people. So kind of with all the stuff that we talked about earlier, be careful who you get involved with because it'll reflect upon your testimony before the Lord. So first part of the message tonight, we see Jehoshaphat setting a precedent. Jehoshaphat setting a precedent. And I think we kind of have an idea of what that general phrase means. It's kind of what I just described, where you make one decision, and then then because of that decision, it sets a pattern going forward. And maybe you've heard that in the court system, where a certain ruling by a judge sets a precedent 
And then going forward, they then base future decisions based on that precedent. And it's kind of hard to go back once you've set the precedent. You know, so it is with us too, that when you set a precedent for certain things, it's kind of hard to go back on what you've said, what you've done to, to make a different decision. You know, once you've made a friendship with somebody to break off that friendship later on, you know, it's better that you never got involved in that friendship if it was going to mean so many bad things for you or if it was going to mean so much that uh, it was going to damage your relationship with the Lord. So Jehoshaphat here is setting a precedent, reading again verse number one. Of course, as I just mentioned there, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. And that's kind of a summary of chapter 17 there. That's, that's a lot of the good part of the life of Jehoshaphat right there. And we see him very much in that chapter by his own people, by the nations around him, gathering this riches and this honor. And, and the nations around him were afraid of him and uh, they honored him. And he had this army. I think we counted up. I don't know who, who was it that added that up. Was that you or Xander? I know it's oh, Xander. He's raising his hand there. That, that 1,160,000 soldiers that, of that army that Jehoshaphat had raised up. You know, all of that that he had at his disposal, yeah, these, these are the, the good things that came from Jehoshaphat making good decisions, and God honored him and allowed his kingdom to grow. But, you know, when you have riches and honor, also with that comes responsibility, too. You have to be able to take care of those riches and honor in a way that's going to be honorable. And so Jehoshaphat here, as we read throughout the rest of this verse here, I'm kind of reminded of a proverb, better is a good name to be chosen than great riches. And when it says a good name there, it's really kind of talking about your reputation. What kind of a reputation are you going to be able to maintain? And Jehoshaphat from this point is going to have a change to his reputation. Up to this point, it's been pretty good. And in fact, uh, I may mention it later, but I think a lot of the reason that Ahab wants to join forces with him is because of that reputation. Oh, Jehoshaphat has this nice army. He has all this riches. You know, maybe I want to get involved with him and uh, maybe get a little, little piece of that, take advantage of that. And Jehoshaphat maybe falls into the trap that some people do. He's, he's just a nice guy. <laughs> you know, has anyone ever called you a nice person? It's, it, we take it as a good thing so often, don't we? But you know, as I've heard it said sometimes, you know, that can actually be a bad thing sometimes because to some people when they say, oh, he's just a nice person, it really just kind of means, well, you're kind of a pushover. You know, people, like, people can walk all over you and people can uh, pretty much kind of have their way with you. So you know, next time someone says you're a nice person, you know, maybe you're in their mind you're kind of questioning why they're saying that. So Jehoshaphat maybe was a nice guy. And probably was in a lot of ways. But again, he had his faults here. So it says here that he joined affinity with Ahab. And the word affinity in the English language, and actually in the Hebrew as well, kind of carries the idea of, of attraction or relationships. To make an affinity with someone is to, to build that relationship. And, and even more specifically in the Hebrew, it's talking about uh gaining a relationship by a, a political union of some kind. Uh, kind of like when the, you marry the king's daughter, you're joining in affinity with that king because you, you have the two kingdoms that are then kind of uh, joining together. And actually, when you read ahead several chapters from here, you have the son of Jehoshaphat, which married one of Ahab's daughters. You, know, you want to know how far this affinity went you know, there's some dangerous things that uh, can be said about that. And Jehoshaphat really got himself in trouble, I think. So then verse number two, it says, after certain years. So they had developed this relationship, and now it, it, it wasn't just a temporary thing. It, over, the, over this course of time now, Jehoshaphat's coming back. Hey, hey, Hab, hi, how are things going? You know, how's, uh, how's my daughter-in-law doing? You know, that kind of a thing. Yeah, I don't know as far as the chronology at this point where uh, his son Jehoram is, but uh, nonetheless, you have after a certain period of time, this has gone on over a certain period of time that they've had this relationship. And Ahab, 
kills all these animals for him. They have this big feast together. And I think this is kind of Ahab's way of kind of buttering up Jehoshaphat and kind of playing him. And you kind of actually get that from the word persuaded there. It says there that he persuaded him to go with him up to Ramoth Gilead. So maybe they're just having dinner one night and it's maybe just like any other dinner. But then at some point the conversation comes up where, uh, you know, uh, Jehoshaphat, you know, I've got these uh, pesky Syrians that have been giving me some trouble. You know, and you have this great big army and you have this great big kingdom. You know, how about helping a brother out? You know, give, give me some help here and, and get these Syrians off my back. And Jehoshaphat, because of the nice guy that he is, decides, well, you see in verse number three here that he makes that decision that he's going to uh, follow through and actually help him with that. So, But it says there he persuaded him. And the word persuading there in the Hebrew has the idea of uh, even misleading or enticing him. That This isn't just uh, convincing him. This is it almost has more of a, a kind of an evil nuance to it where it says he's persuading him there. Maybe trying to use Jehoshaphat kind of as I hinted at earlier. So again, talking about how maybe he was attracted by Jehoshaphat's prosperity. He has all of this great wealth and this great power. And it's something that Ahab sees as a tool that maybe he can use to further himself. Verse number three there, so he poses the question, and then Jehoshaphat's response is, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people. Something I think we realize about some of the decisions that we make is it doesn't always just affect us. Sometimes we may think that a decision may only affect us, but in this case, Jehoshaphat, he's he's bringing the entire kingdom into it. Uh, Maybe you've heard the phrase, throwing people under the bus. Well, now, now everyone else in the kingdom of Judah is going to have to answer to this decision. It, can you imagine what maybe some of his captains, you know, some of those people that are listed in chapter 17, what they might be thinking now of this decision? Jehoshaphat, you got involved with who? You said what? We're going to be fighting who? Who? And all of it is because Jehoshaphat's just a nice guy and he wanted to help Ahab. And so he had this little deal that he made with Ahab, now dragging Judah into Ahab's problem here. So be careful with the decisions that you make because often it affects other people. When you get involved with maybe some of these bad friendships, these bad business relationships, and even thinking about that, bad job situations, you have spouses maybe that get into quarrels over things like that because the, the one spouse wanted to do something and they ended up getting them involved with something that now they're kind of stuck in. And now how are they going to get out of it? And, and they find themselves in big trouble. It could be something like that or maybe in a relationship. I, there, there's a relationship in college that I had to break off at one point because I realized that she and I were going different directions. But if I had never made that initial decision in the first place, I could have avoided all that trouble. And there, of course, she had her friends, I had my friends, and it, it was just a messy situation that I would have, had I made the right decision in the first place, again, I would have avoided that. And I, there's some things, and I won't get into all the details, but be careful the things you get involved in. So think about the things that you join together with people in doing. We've brought up the subject of churches too. What, what happens when churches of different stripes come together under the banner of unity, under the banner of, you know, we want to save souls for Christ. We want to do some great work for the Lord, but yet it means someone having to compromise and an oftentimes uh, both sides are having to compromise in some way. Uh, and usually the more conservative ends up becoming more liberal. That's usually what happens. Kind of like the, the you know, if you see yourself as the stronger person in a relationship, I could use that as an example. It's often the stronger person that gets dragged down when they get pulled into a bad relationship. 
And so it is with churches too. You have those that are more conservative, more biblically based, and just better grounded overall that they make one bad decision and get involved with another church over the name of something, and then they end up... Sometimes it means the church just compromising more and more, or it means having to have an uncomfortable conversation with somebody later on to say, you know what, we're going to have to break this off. Now, it's, it's good that if you get into a bad situation that you take the right steps to get out of it, but it's better to just never be in that situation in the first place. So again, we as leadership here at this church have to be careful with those decisions too, who we get involved with, uh, what kinds of fellowships we get involved in. And you know what? It's okay to keep us accountable to those things. If you see some danger that maybe we might be walking into, by all means, let us know if maybe we're blindsided by something. It's healthy and it's good for us to, to not make a bad decision. So you know, keep your leadership accountable. Make sure that we're walking right. Make sure that we're making right decisions. So we have Jehoshaphat there setting a precedent. And this is a precedent that he sets that is going to make it very difficult to back out later from this situation and is going to set a pattern for other things in the future, which we've already mentioned a couple of those things, but setting a precedent. So next thing I'll look at here, sensing a problem. So this is the second section of what I'd like to look at tonight. And actually this chapter here is something I preached through back in July. So I won't cover a lot of the same details And in fact, when you look through this account, it's going to look awfully familiar to what I looked at several months ago when we looked at the life of Ahab, because you have the parallel account of this in 1 Kings chapter 22, and I approached that more from the perspective of Ahab. And when I preached through 2 Chronicles 18 last year, it was more from the perspective of Micaiah the prophet and the stand that he took. And we're going to encounter him again, but we won't go over a lot of the same details we're focused primarily on looking at Jehoshaphat and his interaction with all of these events that are taking place here. So we're going to cover a lot of verses here. I'll be reading a lot of stuff that I won't be saying a lot of things about, but just kind of saying what I said just to let you know. Uh, I'm not intentionally trying to skip over some details, but just really kind of focusing on Jehoshaphat. So looking at verse number four here now. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets four hundred men and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth-Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we, we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil, the same as Micaiah the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. And the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, Fetch quickly Micaiah the son of Imla. Doesn't it seem like that our our nice guy Jehoshaphat here is uh, trying to be super spiritual now in verse number four? He's gotten into this agreement with Ahab, this friendship this uh, alliance, and now he's getting God involved in this. You know, I think maybe he should have gotten God involved within it before he ever actually made the decision to join together with Ahab, but you know, here, here he is now. He's kind of stuck. He's, he has this alliance with Ahab. He's given him his word, and now he needs to uh, find a way to at least maintain his spirituality in the eyes of men around him. And hence there, it says there in verse four, you know, well, if we're going to do this, let's at least inquire of the Lord, which by the way, that's, that's not a bad choice in and of itself. The fact that he's here is not good, but the fact that he's saying, let's inquire of the Lord, that's a good thing. And in fact, God's going to give him an answer from all this. It's not going to be the answer necessarily that he was expecting, but he's going to get an answer from this inquiry. Now, on the one hand, you have all of these, uh, you might call them yes men. You, you know what those kinds of people are? The, you, know, the, the, you, you have that, that cabinet of people around you that just kind of shake their head yes. You know, the leader wants to make a decision and everyone around him is just saying, yeah, go ahead, go for it. 
You know, maybe it's a, a group of people in a boardroom and they're with, there with the CEO and the CEO ha uh, has his way that he wants to do things. And there's everyone else there in the boardroom that says, yeah, go ahead and do it. It might be the worst decision in the world, but, you know, they're his friends. They go golfing with him. You know, they don't want to ruin their, uh, uh, their relationship. And so they're just, they're just going to say yes to whatever he wants to do. So you have this group of these 400 prophets that are pretty much Ahab's yes men. But, you know, I can kind of sense some alarm bells going off in Jehoshaphat's head here. Something doesn't quite seem right to him. And I don't blame him for that. He's kind of already gotten himself in a pickle here. And I think he's realizing why he shouldn't have made that decision to join affinity with Ahab now. Thinking, this is just way too easy. There's something, something didn't seem right to Jehoshaphat. That all of these people, yeah, go ahead, king. Go ahead, go up to battle. Now, we, when looking at Ahab, we already know what the outcome of the battle is. And so maybe you can kind of see where this is leading for Jehoshaphat. Je I think Jehoshaphat really just deep down knows that this is wrong. That there's, something, there's something wrong about this. And so there he asks in verse number six, well, isn't there another prophet? Yeah, he, maybe he's looking for an out now. I need, I need someone to help get me out of this mess. Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And then, of course, Ahab brings up Micaiah, and we know Micaiah's reputation with Ahab. Yeah, Micaiah wasn't one of those yes men, and so he just kind of kept him in a, in a prison cell somewhere and kind of closed him up. And uh, yeah, he, he was kind of that court jester that you'd bring out every now and then just to kind of laugh at him every now and then. But... Micaiah was one who, as I talked about when I preached through this before, and in fact, we'll look at the verse later on, Micaiah was one who was willing to stand up and say what the Lord wanted him to say. So we have Jehoshaphat here kind of wondering what to do in this situation here. Now, it, at least he could say that maybe he realized, uh, you know, there's the, the mob mentality sometimes that, uh, people will often just go along with the crowd. Well, hey, these other 400 people have said it's okay to do this. Uh, Jehoshaphat, I think, at least had enough sense about him to realize just because 400 people say it's okay doesn't necessarily mean it's okay. And that's good when making some of our decisions about the things that we get involved in. Just because the majority says it's okay doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay. So Jehoshaphat testing the waters here now. And so they're going to go drag Micaiah out of his prison. So we see Ahab's reaction to him in verse number 7. You know, he never prophesied good to me. And I mentioned the verse from Isaiah 5 before. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light, light for darkness. I'm not quoting it exactly, I don't think. But if you want to look at Isaiah 5.20, that pretty well quotes that. Uh, that thought there, as far as uh, Ahab's, what he, kind of he, uh, his perspective here. But then again, you have Jehoshaphat on the other side. He's kind of being derided by King Ahab, but at the same time, it seems like Jehoshaphat's kind of standing up. I don't know exactly what he meant by what he said at the end of that verse there is whether it was to say, you know, you know, don't say that what he's saying is evil because maybe this is actually going to be good. Or maybe thinking about Micaiah's reputation in general. But you have Jehoshaphat there standing up for Micaiah. I'll talk about it later, but maybe what is Micaiah thinking about Jehoshaphat getting together with Ahab in this situation? I'm sure he has his thoughts. So in some ways here, I almost kind of see Jehoshaphat playing both sides now. Now, he, he's trying to look spiritual. He's trying to keep Ahab happy, but at the same time, you have this faithful prophet of the Lord, Micaiah. Well, you know, I, I got to make sure that I stay on his good side too. It, you know, he's, he's, he's a faithful prophet of the Lord, and I'm, I'm this good king. You know, and, and so people say that about me. And so, you know, I kind of got to make sure that I, I kind of put one in for him too. Make sure that I look good in the eyes of Micaiah. Now, I think Micaiah was smart enough to know whether Jehoshaphat was just trying to butter up Micaiah in this situation. But at the same time, it seems like Jehoshaphat was exercising the little bit of sense that maybe he had. 
So going on here, verse number nine, and the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne clothed in their robes, and they sat in a void place at the entering in the, the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. And when I talked about this before, I kind of related it to this circus, and you'll maybe kind of see why in a little bit here. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenaanah, had made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, with these shalt thou push Syria until they be consumed. You know, I can kind of see him going around like this. You're going to beat him like this. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake to him, saying, Behold, the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one assent. Let thy word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. Hey, just go along with the crowd, Micaiah. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. You know, if anyone in this room, I think, had any good sense about them, it was this man, Micaiah, here. You know, if there's anyone that, uh, you know, Micaiah was the one that was willing to be bold enough to speak up for the Lord. And Jehoshaphat, now that he's in this alliance with Ahab, maybe was kind of watching his words. He, have you ever been in a, in a room with somebody or uh, had a friendship with somebody? I don't know, maybe uh, one of the things that we talked about where maybe it was a situation that you shouldn't have gotten involved in. Have you ever found yourself being careful with your words around some of those kinds of people where maybe this isn't the kind of uh, uh, friendship that I need to be developing here or the kind of relationship that I need to be involved in. You, you don't want to hurt their feelings, uh, but yet somewhere in your mind, it's in your conscience to want to try to do the right thing, but you're kind of stuck there. You know, I think Jehoshaphat maybe had good intentions, but was misguided in what he did here. So moving on here, verse 14. So just keep in mind with all of this, Jehoshaphat is just kind of there listening to all of this, watching this take place. And when he was come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I forbear? And he said, go ye up and prosper for they shall be delivered into your hand. And the king said to him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? And again, I'll mention that I think Ahab knew what the right thing was. And on top of that, I think Jehoshaphat knows too. Then he said, verse 16, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return therefore every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good to me, but evil? He always just says bad things, but I'm kind of wondering what's going on in Jehoshaphat's mind now. Now that he's hearing all of these things, maybe already having those alarm bells go off with uh, the things that the other prophets were saying, and now hearing what Micaiah had to say about this, maybe I shouldn't have gotten involved in this after all. Why am I sitting here with Ahab? Boy, if I could just get myself out of this now, but I've already said that I'm going to help him, but Micaiah is saying that we're going to lose. Yeah, Jehoshaphat's really having some problems here now. So verse 18 here, again, he said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab? <laughs> Interesting that it uses that word there. When he saw the word persuaded earlier, I brought that up. Who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake, saying after this manner, and another saying after that manner. Then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. One thing I want to mention here from all of this is this is a judgment that was meant for Ahab. But yet Jehoshaphat is involved with this. So how's Jehoshaphat going to get out of this now? This judgment wasn't meant for Jehoshaphat, but yet because of Jehoshaphat's alliance with Ahab, he now finds himself in this very difficult position. 
going on in verse 22. It says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. Then Zedekiah the son of Chenaanah came near and smote Micaiah upon the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Then the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Amon the governor of the city and to Joash the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction, with water of affliction, until I return in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, all ye people. So not only now is Jehoshaphat witnessing the words of Micaiah the prophet and realizing he's on the losing side of this battle, he's also seeing the mistreatment of this prophet Micaiah. And... When you get involved with things that you shouldn't get involved with and you see yourself ending up on the wrong side of the line and you see the wrong people getting hurt and you realize these people should be my friends and I should be standing with them and yet here I am in my position. Now, what does that do to your conscience? You know, what's going through Jehoshaphat's mind now? Why, why am I letting Micaiah go through all this? I should, be, I should be standing up stronger for this man Micaiah who's standing for the Lord. But notice there in verse 27, the end of verse 27, Micaiah's final plea to everyone standing there, and I want to point out specifically that it says, hearken all ye people. He's including Jehoshaphat with Ahab, with the 400 prophets, with all of the people of Israel standing by there. He, Jehoshaphat is now being identified with that number. Jehoshaphat, the good king, he that, that did right in the eyes of the Lord. And yet we see him being identified with those who are evil. And when you get involved with the wrong kinds of people, that's how people are going to see you too. They're going to see you as, oh, I thought that was that Christian, but he's doing this. And so then now they're going to associate you with those bad things. You know, people... I think maybe Christians set themselves up for failure a lot of times because of some of the things that they get themselves involved with and making bad decisions. And, you know, we might say that people give Christians a hard time sometimes for some of the things they do. But I think maybe sometimes we as Christians put that on ourselves because of some of the choices that we make. So all the more reason to be careful because we don't want to be identified as being on the wrong side of where we should be in the battle of truth. So sensing a problem, and I think Jehoshaphat by this point, he knew he was on the wrong side. He knew he was in trouble. He knew he was in a pickle. He was, how is he going to get out of this dilemma now? So third part, and I think often what happens in these situations, as I've titled this third section of our study tonight, Suffering the Penalty. You can't always expect God to bail you out of things. And thank God that he does sometimes. And thank God for Jehoshaphat that he does bail him out. But he wouldn't have had to bail him out of the situation if he hadn't gotten involved with Ahab in the first place. And so it is with the things that we get involved with that maybe we shouldn't. You know, we can't always expect God to be there to, to pull us out of the fire to keep us from getting burnt. Sometimes God lets us get burnt, sometimes. Sometimes God lets us see the ends of our choices. So, you know, we need to be careful. Suffering the penalty. So going on in verse 28 here. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So he's saying there, kind of like we mentioned before, Ahab's going to just kind of look like everyone else and blend in. But Jehoshaphat, you, you look like you're the king. You, you look like the one that's in charge here so that they don't come after me. Of course, uh, God has a very good targeting system, as we're going to see here. But the other thing in terms of Jehoshaphat and his alliance here is now he's, he's a participant in Ahab's deception. 
He's already gone this far down the road. He's already in trouble. You know, how, how does he back out now? Well, Ahab is making this decision to, to disguise himself. I'm going I'm to try and trick them. All right, Jehoshaphat, look, you just go along with this now. You're, you're, you're my friend in this, right? You're, you're going to help me with this. And we're going to see here that this was almost disastrous for Jehoshaphat. Verse 30. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. See, you see what the Syrians' battle plan was now? You see why this is trouble now for Jehoshaphat? Verse 31, And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight, but Jehoshaphat cried out, and the, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. For it came to pass, that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. Their battle strategy was to look for the person in the robes. And because Ahab had disguised himself, guess, guess who that left? You know, looking like he was the leader, but poor old Jehoshaphat there. And so the Syrians, now, I don't think they necessarily knew about the alliance that they had together. Uh, as far as they were concerned, it was King Ahab and just King Ahab, and he was going to be leading the armies into battle. And so, oh, look, hey, there's the king. Let's go after him. And by the way, the, uh, as far as battle strategy it maybe kind of reminds you of what's been said in other places in Scripture, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That was kind of the mentality of the battle strategy here, was if you get rid of the leader, then you basically don't have to worry about the army because then they're not going to have a leader anymore and, and everything will just kind of fall apart. So Jehoshaphat, again, being mistaken for someone who's on the wrong side. But kind of like we mentioned in a, just a minute ago, God will sometimes bail us out of our bad decisions. And I think God was very merciful to Jehoshaphat. You know, and if we're honest about maybe decisions that we've made in our own lives, God's been merciful to bail us out of certain things. There, I remember, and, and actually this is even before I got saved, but I had made this choice to go to this party that I sh shouldn't have gone to. I had told certain friends that I was going there. It was, I was coming to my last days at the job I was working at this place, and they had invited me to this party. And so, oh, yeah, I was a nice guy. I, was, I wasn't going to say no, and so I went along. And my best friend who had been witnessing to me it, all throughout high school, he, he found out I was going, and, and he called me up, and he had a word with me. He said, Mike, you don't. Yeah. Well, so my word was, you know, I'm okay. I can, I can avoid temptation. I'll be fine. But he said, you don't put yourself in the middle of temptation thinking that you'll get out of it. And that, that was good advice. And so I actually ended up not going to that party. Found out later on that the cops busted up that party. And to think that I wasn't there. God used my friend to, to bail me out of that situation. And then, of course, later on, I gave my life to the Lord. But... Thinking about decisions that you make. Be careful the decisions that you make and the choices uh, of who you get involved with. It, you could end up on the wrong side of that party and get busted up by the cops. Or you could not go in the first place, get your life right with God, and then move on. So we're going to see how this ends up for Jehoshaphat here. Because God's not done with him yet. So, of course, verses 33 and 34 kind of explain how God has really good aim. I'll skip to chapter 19 here. We'll look at these first three verses as we come to a close here. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from the Lord, from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Just as God is honest about people, God is honest toward people, too. God's not always just harping on the bad or just praising you for the good, but he gives the good balance here. 
th this was a bad decision. And God used his prophet Jehu to make sure that Jehoshaphat knew very well. And I think Jehoshaphat by that point in time was hanging his head down and you know, like a dog with his tail between his legs, realizing that he had made a wrong decision. But yet God still was taking him out to the woodshed here. And just like we prepare ourselves to the Lord's table, I'm reminded of some of those verses in 1 Corinthians 11. And I'll read those verses as we come to a close tonight. Making sure that we deal with the things in our lives that aren't going to honor the Lord. And judging ourselves, it says there in 1 Corinthians 11.31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Jehoshaphat was in a situation where he was about to be, you might say here, condemned with the world. But yet God preserved him. God knew that he was one who largely made choices to do right. God wanted to preserve his testimony through Jehoshaphat. And so God delivered him out of this. It wasn't without consequence, though, because it says there in that second verse in chapter 19, back in what we are looking at there, therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Jehoshaphat's going to have some other problems to deal with later in his ministry as king. And I believe largely as a result of being involved in this situation with Ahab. The good thing about reading these things from the Bible, and I'm glad I've had a chance to go through this account three different times. You learn different things every time you go through a passage. And in fact, it's good Bible study advice too, you know, to read things multiple times to, to be able to get the full the breadth and the, the full understanding of it. But thinking about, I don't know what I was just going to say, but... There's a lot that we can learn, and these things are written for the purpose that we don't have to make the same mistakes. That's kind of the thought that I was trying to get out there. Just like God talks about those things of the children of Israel, how they were written for our learning, for our admonition, God doesn't want us to make the same mistakes. And so God leaves us his word for us to understand so that we, with a tender heart, looking at his word, can see the mistakes that other people make and not make the same mistakes. And I need to preach to myself sometimes, because sometimes I see myself as a nice guy. Someone who, if I were to go so far as to say it, a people pleaser. And that makes certain situations very difficult. And that's something that is something that you can pray for for me even. I'll even be bold enough to say it. That, that I would have the boldness to be able to, to say the right things to people sometimes when they need to hear it and not get involved with certain things. So I need to, I need to preach to myself through this message. It's a good message, and I'm glad that when God got a hold of my heart some 20 years ago now, that he gave me certain convictions. And I believe God wants me to be a voice to be able to help uphold those convictions. And here I am today, I, I am glad that I am in the church that I'm in. And, and I think oftentimes God uses situations like this to protect me, to make sure that I keep doing right. And just as I encouraged you guys earlier, keep your leadership accountable. Keep us making, making sure that we are walking the right path. But of course, as those who try to teach you, we want to, you guys to make the right decisions too. And so... My encouragement to you is to make sure that you just follow the advice of what we found here tonight. Make the right decisions now so that you don't have to make harder decisions later. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you for counting me faithful to put me into the ministry. Thank you for your goodness and for your mercy, for your long-suffering, because oftentimes, Lord, you treat us as we don't deserve. You're so good to us. Lord, my desire deep down in my heart is to want to honor you and to want to serve you and to, to do my best for you, to, for you to have 
your way with me. To be led by your spirit, to walk in the spirit, to not walk in the lust of my flesh. Help me, Lord, but help these who are here tonight as well. And anyone else who may fall under the sound of this message that your word would have its way with them, that it would accomplish the purpose to which you've sent it as the rain falling on the ground grows up the grass. Lord, so let your word accomplish what it was meant to do in our lives. And so strengthen us and help us. Help us at First Baptist Church of Westminster to be a beacon for you, those who will be bold enough to make the right choice, even when it's difficult, to, to say no when we have to say no, but to say yes to you, Lord. And so, Lord, as we go from this place, help us to shine our lights in this world that they might see Christ in us, that people might glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Lord, keep us safe as we go our separate ways tonight. Thank you for what you can and will do through us as we remain faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thank you for enduring with me tonight, and I am looking forward to joining together in fellowship with you all here again. So Saturday for John and Romans and Outreach, as uh, was mentioned when Rodney prayed for it earlier, we we're we we're really trying to push that. Uh, we're, in fact, I was even commenting to the guys yesterday as we were driving around that uh, we're we're getting north of 80th Avenue now in our in our uh, door knocking and door hanging and all of that. So that's that's really exciting. You know, pray that uh, that we'll have some fruit from that. Just just as we've heard, and it's it's been really good to see. But God bless you guys. Have a good night, and I will see you next time I see you.